from what I see, I see so many comments of that saying, oh, it doesn't matter what you buy. They're all going to, they all have their problems. Pick the one that looks the nicest to you <laughs> or, or that rides the best, you know, whatever it is. While you're absolutely correct, those are two things that the customer base still values sometimes over the potential for issues. Yeah. No, I want a, I want a great looking vehicle or a great riding vehicle or a vehicle that has particular subset of options, whether it's air conditioned seats or, you know, many of the electronic issues that are in vehicles today. Massaging you can, seats. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's there. You, you almost cannot buy a new vehicle that has electric power accessories. All the power accessories today are electronic. You can't get a simple electric power window system or power lock system that has no electronic operation. Control modules and electronics are all parts of these systems today. And when you have a problem with a control module and you can't open or close your windows or can't unlock or lock your doors and move your seats or use your instrument panel, your gauges, your air conditioning, I mean, it's just overcomplicated things to the point where we could have electrics, uh, excuse me, electric systems and have all these things work and last. Do you think that uh, I I have this theory that I re I used to work on BMWs all the time just in my garage and I would flip them because nice. you know, they were terrible. And it's interesting <laughs> that a lot of the problems I saw from the 2000s, the kind of early 20 teens BMWs, it, it's like all the American and Toyota are now venturing into that like highly complicated CAN bus systems. And now they're all they're having all the same problems BMW used to have. You're absolutely correct. But this is one of the topics where we start to get into uh, government regulation uh, in terms of safety. And, you know, there's also obviously uh, emissions components, but not to this in particular, but these high speed networks, which started out obviously as a, a serial bus and then going to uh, CAN bus. Uh, General Motors, for example, has high speed, low speed LAN for their CAN bus system. Um, everything now is going to a traditional local network, just like for your home computers or servers, where everything is going to work on an actual Ethernet based mm -hmm. LAN network for higher speed uh, interconnectivity. And that has grown to that extent partially from government oversight and regulation, um, especially the high speed networks. They want to make sure that the electronic brakes, electronic traction control, uh, the engine transmission are all on a extremely high speed network. Oh, excuse me. Also, the supplemental inflatable restraint system uh, for safety reasons, uh, for crashes and accidents. They want those to be communicating as quick as possible to try and protect the occupants and protect the vehicle. Having these other control modules end up on that network to me is a complete waste. And they've been slowly transitioning to faster and faster secondary networks for the, like we said, uh, a driver's door control module or a body control or, you know, anything outside of electronic brakes, suspension, airbags, you know, engine transmission. But the government has to an extent requirements for all the safety related subset systems. And obviously they get involved in the emissions control systems as well. Right now, GM's V8s and Chrysler's V8s with their cylinder deactivation, that's in a huge part because of emissions and government oversight. Trust me, we don't want those systems in these vehicles. Having these engine failures now with something that started out in the early 2000s as four cylinder shutdown, and having eight lifters involved to now all eight cylinders being in that system and having all 16 potential lifters be involved and fail. The guys from some of the powertrain groups that are working on that engine, they, they don't want these systems, even to extent GM doesn't want them because of the issues and expense. But unfortunately, they're not going to go anywhere because of uh, CAFE and other government oversight. Yeah, I mean, to delete a DFM solution is such a nightmare it's like why buy the engine if you're going to go delete it in my opinion <laughs> i agree you know it's you got to tear it down so far 
get the lifters out to truly delete it properly. The psychology is changing of people. I see people saying that my truck's been really reliable. I made it 30,000 or I'm at 60,000, no issues. And I'm just thinking, wow, has the, has the goalpost moved from, you know, 200,000 was a reliable car to 30, 60, you know, 70,000. <laughs> and that's what it seems to be. People are, people are really seeing that as a milestone, you know, like I haven't had a single issue. And when they hit a hundred thousand, it's like you hit the gold mine now. Uh, you could not be more correct. It, it, the bar has been lowered and it's so sad. I, I discuss with my contemporaries to look at older vehicles from, from all different makes and models, find an older vehicle that you like, hopefully with less complexity, you know, get it into good shape and maintain that thing. And it'll last. I mean, yeah. 200,000, 300,000, 400,000 uh, without issue. On the newer engines, things like direct injection, something else that's government oversight, cafe regulated. Um, we don't want it in our engines. We don't, we don't want that system, period. It's honestly, it's filthy. The, the carbon and oil buildup um, in the intake tract, it's disgusting. At 50,000 miles, if you looked at the back of the intake valves, they're so restricted that the engine is down significantly on power. People who don't drive the vehicle aggressively probably would never notice except that the idle characteristics eventually change and eventually there's enough misfiring at some point for a check engine light. But otherwise, a lot of people are oblivious to it based on their driving habits. Yeah. And I feel a lot of the people, as you said, are saying, oh, I haven't had any issues at 30,000 miles or 40,000. It comes down to their driving style or potentially they are doing slightly more maintenance than, than is recommended because, you know, at that point, there's almost no maintenance recommended. Yeah, they do walnut blasting. I know on Audis, they have a, you know, 30,000 mile service and they just, it's just normal for people to spend $1,200 to have your valves walnut blasted. And it's like, that's not. $1,200 for a maintenance item is, it's just, it's getting crazy. I just think the, the society's kind of losing their mind and, and the fact that people spend it is more crazy to me, but. Well, it is crazy to me as well. However, some of these manufacturers have engineered, so to speak, or created a scenario where their customers, their clientele expect these high maintenance fees for some vehicles and it's good and it's bad. Um, I'm not particularly fond of something like the Shell Media for that particular service for a vehicle that has their engine put together. Um, that's a media that's definitely used on engine components when they're disassembled. I think some of the more chemical oriented treatments, both spraying that treatment directly through a fully open throttle body or running it through the fuel rail, um, disconnecting the, the fuel source from the fuel pump to the fuel rail, removing that from being able to feed any fuel to the engine and just running it almost like an IV bag, so to speak, um, but with a small pump to the rail and running that cleanser through the injectors or again, through the throttle body and in conjunction oftentimes but once you chemically break down that stuff, running the engine to evacuate it, uh, it's nasty. Um, yeah. It's not good for the piston rings. Um, it's not good for the oil because that stuff gets past the rings at some point and into the oil. The vapors in the crankcase are quite nasty when they're not evacuated through a uh, crankcase ventilation system. And a lot of people don't maintain that system. It gets clogged off. That actually makes your oil last far shorter, um, especially when you're being told, don't change it, follow your oil life monitor, which is a complete disaster, honestly. But it's another way of planned obsolescence, believe it or not. Everyone know, knows that these things occur and it's just, nope, not a problem. We're going to ignore it. <laughs> Put blinders on. And and we so we do direct injection and then we turbocharge it. That's the that's the awesome <laughs> part. That's everything's turbocharged DI on these four cylinders and six cylinders. It is, but there's been at least with General Motors that I've seen the return of some port fuel injection. And I don't mean solely. I mean the direct injection is there, but then there'll be secondary fuel injectors that are traditional port electronic injection. 
to periodically wash down the back of the intake valves. And that's been a benefit that was tested with Corvette quite a long time ago. Uh, but Corvette has been somewhat of a testing ground for a lot of GM's technologies. So that's expected to be seen in more of their vehicles, especially the V8s coming soon. And it's not a solution because the, the direct injection really needs to go, but it is a benefit. We can't get the fuel economy without the direct injection. Direct injection just saves on fuel and there is some benefit with emissions. People used yeah. to think that direct injection itself produces more power than a traditional electronic fuel injector. You know, that's something you'll hear often. It factually does not, only because what you're hearing is a partial statement. The direct injection creates more power per volume of fuel. And that's solely because it consumes and uses less fuel to operate. All in all, a traditional port injector can support and produce more power, bar none. I've heard that too, that it, the, the port injection, when you have port and DI, you actually have better low end torque due to the port injection. But I noticed Toyota, I watch a lot of other channels like the Car Care Nut, and he tore down that V6 from Toyota, 3.4 liter twin turbo direct injection, and it has port injection as well. And he said he's seen it multiple times on their, their DI engines that have port injection. He said they're still kind of a carbon mess, even around 40 or 50,000 miles. It looks like they're still gumming up pretty bad around the valves. So I, I still don't think that port's going to solve all of our issues, not compared to the old, you know, where you just had straight port injection. But I, what do you think not, about that? Yeah, it's not. But again, that's in part because of CAFE and government oversight. So those vehicles have to primarily run on the direct injection. And that's the main issue. Really what this offers with the strategy uh, for the traditional port injectors, they're, they're not used to a great extent. And that's by design. We could change things to make them used to a greater extent, which would be beneficial to the engine, but it would kind of cause other emissions type of problems. The direct injection has its own associated emissions problems. You may recall quite a few years ago, Volkswagen got in trouble for essentially trying to falsify yeah. the emissions reported for their vehicles. And that stemmed primarily from direct injection and not having those intake runners, ports, valves cleaned. Um, that creates its own subset of emissions problems. So it's it's something that we could really improve quite substantially if permitted to use those port injectors to a far greater extent. But I'm, I don't think we'll ever see that just because of the regulations in place. If you want to watch the full interview with Cello, click right here.